Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. And uh, at this time, I would like to call to order the regular monthly meeting of the Newport News School Board for Tuesday, April 16th, 2019. On behalf of the members of the school board and our superintendent, I welcome each of you present and watching. A quorum is present to transact the business of the school division. We will begin tonight's meeting with the invocation and pledge to the flag. Here to do the honors are two students from Lee Hall Early Childhood Center, Heidi Pavosa Lopez and Shamir Wasalowski. Is that correct? Wasalowski? Okay, um, first Heidi will come forward and deliver the invocation. She will be followed by Shamir, who will come forward and deliver the pledge. So uh, Heidi, would you please come forward and tell us a little bit about yourself before you get started? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Heidi Maria Pavusa Lopez. I go to Lee Hall Early Childhood Center, and I like to go to Sweet Frog and um, school. I have a poem to share about kindness. Kind hearts are the gardens Kind thoughts are the roots. Kind words are the blossoms. Kind deeds are the fruits. Thank you. Heidi, that was right. that was outstanding, absolutely outstanding. You can come back and do that again. <laughs> and so now we have Shamir. Will you please come forward and tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Hi, my name's Samir. I go to Early Childhood Center, and I like trains. You may stand up for the pledge. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> Samir, uh, listen, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, we've heard a lot of individuals come up who are much older than you wow. are. You two were outstanding, amazing. Wow. Uh, we're going to invite you back um, later in the year, possibly. Wow. Definitely next year. <laughs> I may send you down to the city council. Yeah. <laughs> let her know. That was, that was, <laughs> <laughs> let us know that, don't let that we're, we're, we are um, oh, doing our best here with our students. And um, if you two are a fine example right. of this is early childhood yes. we're talking about, this is outstanding. Yes. And so me and my uh, colleagues up here, we want to thank you and give you another round of applause. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, supporting uh, Heidi and uh, Shamir tonight or their family and, and school family, could you please stand up and be recognized? Wow, great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. I tell you, the board appreciates the encouragement that you have uh, given wow. these two uh, young students. And again, we thank you for bringing them to the meeting this evening. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I guess we're going to move the agenda, I guess, is next. And uh, we're going to have uh, board recognitions. Is that correct? Uh, Dr. Parker, would you join me in front? Yes, Mr. Chair. Good evening. On behalf of the school board and the superintendent, I'm presenting this month's recognitions. 
The National Association of Music Merchants Foundation recognizes outstanding efforts by teachers, administrators, parents, and community leaders who work together to ensure access to music learning for all students as part of the school's curriculum. Each year, the organization names the best communities for music education. We are proud to share tonight that Newport News Public Schools is named to this list. Present this evening to acknowledge this honor is Pat Franklin, the Supervisor of Fine and Performing Arts. Ms. Franklin, please come forward. And Pete Mercier, the Secondary Music Lead. Please come forward. Ms. Uh, Becky Riebling, who is the elementary music lead, was unable to join us this evening. Newport News Public Schools offers music education beginning in kindergarten. At the elementary level, students are introduced to music through the, through the use of songs, movement, and instruments. In middle school, students may take band, orchestra, or chorus and join performance ensembles. Newport News High Schools offer more than 15 music courses, including courses in advanced placement. High school ensembles perform numerous concerts each year. C community performances are an integral part of the Newport News Public Schools music program. Student musical ensembles have played in such places as the Ferguson Center for the Arts, the Downing Gross Cultural Arts Centers, and at numerous grand openings, celebrations, and groundbreaking ceremonies across the community. Newport News Public Schools has a diverse music curriculum, which includes the Summer Institute for the Arts, an intensive six-week program in music, dance, theater arts, and visual arts, and also two performing or two arts and communications magnets at the middle school level and the high school level. This, we were talking about earlier, is the fourth consecutive time that Newport News has earned this designation. Thank you, and please share this acknowledgement with all of our music educators and our students. Thank you. While they make their way back to their seats, I'd also like to acknowledge the Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Nancy Sweat. Thank you. <laughs> the School Division's Business Department is responsible for providing sound financial management of the School Division's resources. One of its most important duties is financial reporting. As a public institution, the financial reporting must be understandable, transparent, and concise. This evening, we're pleased to share that the Association of School Business Officials International has again recognized Newport News Public Schools for its annual financial report. ASBO, as the organization is known, awarded the school division a Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting for its comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year 2018. Accepting this recognition on behalf of the business department is Assistant Superintendent for Business and Support Services, Mary Lou Rosso. The Certificate of Excellence is the highest recognition for school division financial operations awarded by ASBO and is only awarded to school districts that have met or exceeded program standards. The financial report was judged by an impartial, professional panel of auditors. The auditors noted that our financial report is a thorough and detailed representation of the school division's financial condition and exceeds the generally accepted accounting principles. The report, written by the accounting team, including Supervisor Steve Cannell and accounting analyst Kimberly Powell, is recognized for providing a variety of information, including financial statements, supporting schedules, statistics, and narrative explanations. The awards program is designed to encourage school districts to provide the public with a fair representation of all funds and financial transactions. Newport News Public Schools is just among a select few districts across the country who, to earn the award this year. This is the ninth year that the school division has earned this award. 
Again, congratulations, Ms. Rosso, and please pass along our congratulations to the entire counting team. Thank you. Congratulations again to all of tonight's honorees. At this time, we'll take a six minute break so that our honorees and our guests um, may leave if they choose to do so. Of course, you're all welcome to stay. During this time, our viewing audience will have an opportunity to view this month's school board spotlight. So we'll stand in recess for about six minutes. Thank you. Every day, technology plays an important role in Newport News Public Schools to enhance the learning experience for all students. High quality instruction, challenging content, and access to innovative solutions at school and at home allow students, staff, and families to learn and grow together. At the end of February, Digital Learning Day was an opportunity for schools to showcase their technological expertise while instructional technology coaches introduced new digital tools to create even more amazing learning experiences. Pre-kindergarten students at Watkins Early Childhood Center interacted with Nearpod lessons on mobile devices to work on letter and sound recognition. Teachers guided the students through these lessons to help build their vocabulary skills. At Greenwood Elementary, Second graders learn how to navigate a number line using robots. With the number line marked on the floor, teams of students used their coding skills to accurately navigate a Sphero bolt to create an addition or subtraction sentence. Sanford Elementary students had a chance to transform their research papers into interactive digital books. Using Book Creator, students learn how to blend text, images, audio, and video to publish their own creative and engaging stories. And foreign language students at Menchville High School broaden their linguistic skills through interactive activities. A custom Nearpod lesson sparked full class participation and instant feedback for French students, while Spanish students used Flipgrid to record video prompts of themselves speaking out loud to build understanding and fluency. By sharing their experiences across social media, Digital Learning Day allowed students and staff to showcase their academic and digital advances, many of which take place every day in Newport News Public Schools. As a teaching and learning community for non-traditional students, Point Option continues to find unique and creative options to foster personal and academic growth. A new partnership with One Life Fitness is providing Point Option students with the ultimate fitness experience during their physical education classes. Every week, Coach Reggie Garrett buses 9th through 12th grade students to the One Life Fitness Center located a few blocks away in City Center. During this unique physical education class, Coach Garrett guides students through cardio workouts and strength training cycles on state-of-the-art equipment while stressing proper techniques and safety. The students also learn gym courtesy by wiping down the machines after using them. The range of equipment available to the students allows them to explore new, fun, and challenging ways to get and stay fit. This partnership came about when Point Option Principal Chris Smith was working out at One Life Fitness. He met General Manager Roger Lee and found out Lee was coached by Point Option's Reggie Garrett in football at a Virginia Beach High School years ago. From here, coach and player 
worked out a cohesive partnership between Point Option and One Life Fitness. And as the partnership continues to grow, students taking the Point Option outdoor education class are able to learn bike safety during spin classes offered at One Life Fitness. With Point Option's emphasis on creating a small, supportive, and challenging learning environment for all their students, One Life Fitness is helping Coach Garrett provide the same conditions for fitness and physical growth. Sailors from the USS George Washington aircraft carrier spread the love of reading to elementary students in Newport News Public Schools. In honor of the first President of America's birthday, the sailors read to kindergarten and first grade classrooms at Greenwood and Richneck Elementary Schools about the significant life and bravery of George Washington. 60 sailors volunteered their time at both schools to read the picture book biography I am George Washington. In each classroom, the students listened with great interest as the sailors told the true story about one of Virginia's favorite sons. Copies of the book were gifted to each classroom, and the sailors passed out coloring books about the founding father for the students to keep. The sailors also answered questions about their careers in the Navy, places around the world they've traveled to, and what it's like living aboard an aircraft carrier. The visits at both schools were coordinated by professional school counselor, Dana Madison. For our young students, there's no better way to learn about a classic American hero than straight from the mouth of today's heroes, who continue to protect our country's freedoms. Okay, uh, we welcome you back and hope that you enjoyed the school board spotlight. Uh, during our meeting, we provide time for the public to address the board. Now, these are scheduled at the beginning of the meeting and then again toward the end of our meeting. The board considers this an opportunity to listen to you. Uh, we, we understand that, uh, and we will consider your comments and we will get back with you at a later time. We will ask you to abide by our rules and our three minutes limits. When you begin, the green light comes on. Uh, when you have 30 seconds remaining, the yellow light comes on, and then this red signal and it tells you to uh, come to an end and we ask you to conclude your comments. So at this time, as you hear your name, and we do have some cards, uh, please come forward. Uh, we do have some cards, it's at random key Greetings, everyone. Greetings. 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 Uh, come here for work wrestling. Um, speaking for behalf of Coach White. I'm a former member of work wrestling team. I graduated in 2009. I played second in states. I've known Coach for two years, or more than two years, actually. That's when he taught me in, in high school. Uh, he also, you know, taught me more afterwards in high school than got me into college. I went to Mark State University, graduated from there. Coach so White was one of the few, few, few people I brought up there to take a picture with me, you know, celebrate my victory, get my degree. Um, uh, hopefully, I hope that, you know, his tenure at work continues. I hate to see him leave and get terminated. Uh, he's doing great things at Warwick High School, wrestling team. He's just got the kids going to districts, going to states, winning the districts, placing the states. And also, he's got kids, you know, maintaining 3.5 for the team, keeping the team up, truly being student athletes. Um, I would feel very sad to see that a man who worked so hard at Warwick High School to leave and leave off the legacy that he has. I want to see him continue to teach those kids, be the father to those kids, be a mentor to those kids. And kids can come up from middle school, can come up as well and see how great Coach White is for them and beyond, like he did for me. Um, 
I just want to say that uh, please do not terminate Coach White. Keep him at Warwick High School. Let him stay there. Teach those kids. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have, I think it's Kenyon Thong and Aiden Adir. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Aiden Adair. I'm a second year wrestler at Warwick High School. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Kenyon Thorne, and I'm first year wrestler at Warwick High School. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lily Creekmore, second year wrestling high school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, just to key on what uh, the man said before us, we really do believe Coach White deserves to keep his job as he busts his tail like, day in and day out. We, we aren't really dressed up professionally for y'all. We're sorry, but we just came from practice, and he, he kind of ingrains us as that if the harder and harder you work, the more and more you will succeed in the sport. And before we came, the the team, we heard that the team had five peep wrestlers on their team before Coach White was there. But when Coach White showed up, he got the team up to 36. And they got, and it steadily became a more stronger and stronger team. As, um, oh, the year before we came, they were second in district. And then the, the year we, our freshman years, we won district. And the next year we won district. Uh, hello. Uh, you know, my input on Coach White is he's like a great. He can be a father as well as a coach at the same time. Like he, the things he says and does for you, shows you like a man figure, and also a father figure. Even though he's really just being there, you know, just to coach you. But I mean, it gets to your heart and like, it really helps you push through all the hard stuff. Like I mean, we've done things that you would see like adults doing, like I don't know the army and stuff. But we. Even we can push through it. I mean, like, we fight hard. Even we have girls on our teams who came up there. They've won things and they've uh, achieved, I mean, like, not a sexy type of way, but, I mean, like, and not a lot of girls will come to a sport like wrestling because, like, they, they feel like it's a more of a manly sport. But when they do come and they have somebody like Coach White trying to teach them how to do stuff, it's more, it encourages them that they can actually accomplish things. And, I mean, like, he's done a lot to bring us together as a team. Like, we've... Like, we've tried to have activities. He tried to see if we could go out places together, you know, to bring us together as family so that when we do fight against another team, it's as frightened as one, not just as individuals. And it does help out as a team. because like, you get the momentum going and you have, a, hey, you got one person scoring points and you bring them up. And then if he does lose, the next person doesn't let that sit in and say, he just goes out there and whoops tail. Um, good afternoon. And, like, my take on Coach White is, like, for it. And, my first instance going into wrestling this year was just get better, like help get better in football. But during the end of the season, like he like pushed me and like helped me like push my thoughts to like stay in next year and stand for the rest of my high school career. And um like I really think like he should be here until like eternity. <laughs> uh uh, thank you for hearing us. Uh, we just we really do believe that Coach White shouldn't have to. This shouldn't be happening. Coach White should still have his job. So we we beg of you that you please give, reinstate Coach White's job. Thank you. Okay. Next we have uh, Staley Hampton <coughs> and Kamari Thorne. Good evening. My name is Staley Hampton. I'm our 195. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Kamari Thorne, and I'm a first year wrestler at Boyd High School. We're here because Coach White shouldn't be terminated. He's more than just a coach to us. He really advocates for us to be student athletes. He pushes for the GPA more than he does for the sport of wrestling. I came freshman year not really wanting to wrestle but he really reaches out to the kids and makes sure they come out. Because like my peers said, we had five before he came, but the numbers rose up once he went. Uh, when I uh, first started, I wasn't really uh, interested, but like by the time, midway through the season, where he uh, 
he showed us like the improvement and how wrestling can get you better, not only in not only in uh just wrestling aspects, but uh life. And it it really like let the wrestling team stand out from others and uh from like other sports. Yeah, it shows that that he really uh cares and appreciate what we do and we appreciate what he does to uh to help us get better. Also, he really makes sure we're more than just teammates. We're family, because we have we have fun nights. Like, like we we do we have we play games and stuff like after practice, and plus we we do so many tournaments. Like, like our one tournament, Mountain View, we stayed overnight, and that was a good experience for all of us, because we really got closer together, as teammates, and I feel like Nutty Comb just doesn't want us to be good or to get better. To be the best people we can be. Uh, I feel that uh, Coach Nunnycomb really doesn't care about wrestling. She really cares about the sports that's like really bringing in the money, but really doesn't. She don't care about what we're doing as a team and what we're growing as like people and young men and women. And I think we really, uh, Coach White should really uh, be back. He should be back and. Uh, we should be ready to go uh, before season starts. Thank you. That's all. Uh, Pam Hall. Good evening. Um, I would just like to say thanks for supporting Huntington Middle School funding and the educators. I stand with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Renee Lovett. <laughs> Good evening. I, I think all of you know who I am. and and how often you see my face and I see your faces. And I also want to say thank you. Thank you so much for supporting us. And uh, I can't wait till you get the school built. So whatever you need, we're, we're still behind you. And I like that cheer. We're backing you up, OK? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reverend James Brown. Good evening. Good evening, school board, Mr. Hunter, Dr. Parker, the rest of the school board members. Um, as you can see, teachers are more important than just teaching a classroom. Most teachers instill hope and the, and the incentive that a child can go on and do more than just do a great sport. Many of the kids that come here or that were here probably had the option of school, staying in school with a sport, or being on the street in a game. That's the reason why schools are important. And when I hear the city say that they have to do more for other areas of the city, and the school board is just an entity that if they got something, basically, they put it there. Teachers need salaries where they don't have to worry about feeding their own families and they can teach other kids happily. I know I work with kids. I enjoy working with kids. I work with mine, and now I'm working with other people's kids because I realize how important the future is. We can educate or we incarcerate. I thank this board for doing the great job that you're doing, putting the pressure on the city of Newport News to understand that education is the key to our future. If we educate our kids, they'll come back home. If there's something to come back to, they'll come back, and the city will grow. It's not all about economics. It's not all about economics. It's about people. It's about children, children who need hope. Middle schools, as Huntington Middle School, in the location that it's in, would bring more hope to that community than you can imagine. Because these are the kids that are suffering the most. They need the hope. So continue, Dr. Parker, Pam, y'all have done a great job. The meeting today was, if anybody was listening, if anybody really care, they wouldn't hesitate any longer in getting the money, providing what you need, 
Not surpluses, because there are no surpluses. <laughs> we have budgets that things always left out. So we don't need to ask for money again for something we can do with the money we have. So continue to work in the efforts that you're doing. You're doing a great job, and I 100% support you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Darling Messick. Good evening. Um, I'm a parent of a wrestler, um, actually three wrestlers um, for the last eight years. And um, unfortunately, my son couldn't be here tonight because he's working. Um, and I'm here. Uh, he's a senior this year. And you would think that I would just not even have any more concerns about the team because he's my last son. All three of my boys wrestled. He's done after this year until he uh, – goes to the apprentice school and hopefully wrestles for them. Um, my concern for this program is the lack of support that we have gotten. Um, no support from the AD. Um, every time that the coaches try to do an extra tournament or off-season practice, it's always a no-go. You know, these kids, if any of you have ever wrestled, um, it has to be a year round. I mean, they have to have um, the extra workouts and the extra uh, time on the mat. Um, if you don't have that, then you can have more injuries. You can, which we had quite a few this year because um, they've closed down the wrestling room for other activities or things that go on. So we were low priority. We've never had priority um, with. Uh, that sport, as far as I'm concerned as a parent, um, I've never been um, approached by the AD and accomplishments that all three of my sons have made for Warwick High School. Um, they've placed at states. My oldest son um, is a national champion. Uh, there's no display of any of, not just my children, but of them winning districts the last two years. Um, everybody wants recognition when you do something good. It makes you want to push harder. Um, they don't get that. They haven't had that. Um, their coaching staff, I feel, has um, gone over and beyond trying to get them more tournaments and recognition, um, new singlets, new uh, sweatsuits. Everything's been denied, uh, pretty much. I mean, I think they finally got new singlets. Um, this past year, guys, um, but they've been having to share or no showers, um, no working showers. Work high school is supposed to be a storm shelter or whatever. Uh, the showers haven't worked for I don't know how long, <laughs> uh, which you know um, is a great concern. Um, the mats they had to clear out the uh, wrestling room because of the um, the filthiness of you know, the mats where um, the boys and girls, um, their shower, you can't shower after practice because, you know, and th that's a big concern. Um, but um, hopefully uh, things will change and um, these guys that are left on the team will get the support that they need and um, they can continue to grow. And I didn't want this to be negative. I want it to be positive. Um, so hopefully with you guys here and what everybody has said, we can turn it around to a positive thing there. So thank you so much. I appreciate you listening and um, taking in all our concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are there any more cards? Are there any more cards? Are there any more cards? Uh, there being then we will uh, thanks again for all those who came forward as again we will take all your comments and we'll get back to you at a later time so. okay we'll move the agenda then um, item number three consent agenda uh, 3.01 the minutes and public hearing March 12th 2019 3.02 minutes from work session March 19th 2019 3.03 minutes from the special meeting March 19th, 2019. Uh, 3.04, the minutes from our regular meeting, March 19th, 2019. 
3.05 or financial reports, child nutrition services, March 2019, and the revenue and expense, March 2019. Uh, 3.06 are personnel reports, and that would be our consent agenda. Can we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I uh, make a motion to adopt the consent agenda. You heard the motion. Is there a second? A second. You heard the motion and a second. Time for the question. There being none, uh, Ms. Buffalo, please call the roll. Mr. Harris. Four. Mr. Hunter. Four. Ms. Simons. Four. Ms. Searles Law. Four. Dr. Best. Four. Mr. Brown. Four. Mr. Ely. Four. Motion carries 7 0. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, our next items item number four action item special education and you plan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Dr. Mitchell will be presenting, will be, uh, has presented that plan and it's up for, uh, for board uh, consideration. Uh, I believe um, we did hear that at our previous meeting. If there's no questions uh, for Dr. Mitchell, can we get a motion to approve uh, the special education annual plan? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm a motion to adopt the special education plan as presented uh, last month. Second. You heard the motion and you heard the second. Time for the question. There being none, Ms. Buffalo, please call the roll. Mr. Harris. Four. Mr. Hunter. Four. Ms. Simons. Four. Mrs. Searles Law. Four. Dr. Best. Four. Mr. Brown. Four. Mr. Ely. Four. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. So we'll move on to our reports and information 5.01, your human resource staffing updates. I believe Ms. Stephanie Hartz will come and give us a report. Good evening, Chairman Hunter, Vice Chair Brown, board members, and Dr. Parker. Um, good evening. I'm really pleased to be here with you this evening um, to give you an update. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about recruitment and retention work in Newport News Public Schools. Um, this evening, specifically, we're going to talk about um, our teacher hiring priorities, the priorities we've set, as along with the needs that go with those. We're going to talk about the state of the teacher pool that's out there, um, as well as specifically the strategies that we're using around recruiting and then a little bit on retention as well. So let's talk about our recruiting priorities. These are the four priorities that we've set as our priorities for the school division. Number one, obviously the most important is to hire quality teachers for all of our classrooms. Um, followed by that, we want to increase the number of minority teachers in Newport News Public Schools. We also want to fill what we term as our hard to fill areas, and we'll talk about what those are in a few minutes. And then uh, last but not least, of course, is to fill the vacancies we have um, as of the first day of school. So we want to have our classrooms full with quality teachers. So those are our priorities. And so let's talk a little bit about some of the data that goes with those priorities. Uh, first of all, these are the um, numbers of instructional staff that have been hired over the last five years. Um, when you look at those numbers, that is an average of 275 instructional staff. That includes not only classroom teachers, but the other teacher type positions, guidance counselors, librarians, and interventionists as well. So those are our numbers. When we look at our demographics of our teacher um, staff, these are the actual cohorts that we've hired over the last four years, or five years, excuse me. So as we are working to hire more minorities, this is um, each of those cohort groups each year. And so as you see, um, not a lot of movement, unfortunately, but continuing to work on that. Basically, what we have is um, one third of our, te our teaching staff um, is minority and two thirds are white. And you say, okay, is that good, bad, or indifferent? Um, well, what our measure is what does our community and our student population look like? So when we compare that then to the number of students that we have, our percentages as well as our community, um, you're gonna see that inverse basically effect when we look at our students. We kind of have the reverse of that. 77% of our students are minority and 23% are white. When we look at the community as a whole, it's a little bit more evenly split. Um, with 45% white and 55% minority. So there obviously is why um, hiring more minority, minority teachers is a, is a priority for us. 
we look at hard to fill. This is our definition in Newport News of hard to fill based on our hiring, our hiring abilities um, the last um, probably almost 10 years now. Um, you've heard us talk about the, the difficulty in hiring math and special education teachers. And so what you're seeing here are actual numbers of hires um, in each of those areas over the past five years. And so when you look at math and at special education, you're seeing big, nice chunks of teachers having to be hired each year in those areas and very difficult to do as well. Um, when, you, when we talk about the, the uh, vacant classrooms we had at the start of the school year this year, this is where they were in special education and math. Um, ESL, we've talked about in many different um, venues here now and the growing population we have in ESL. Um, you also know that um, the last three years we have increased actually the number of teachers that are allocated for ESL um, through our budget process. And so with a little bit of turnover we have, we haven't had a whole lot in ESL, but with the additional positions that we've added, um, then we're hiring a good a number of them each year, and they are not very easy to find. Um, there are lots of differences in the types of programs that are out there at the university level. Um, luckily, we, the state has now um, provided a way to add the endorsement through a praxis test, so hopefully we'll continue to have uh, teachers add that as an endorsement as we need additional teachers. Um, world language, um, again, not a place that we have a lot of turnover, but when we do, um, finding French and Spanish and every once in a while a German teacher is very difficult, um, and that's because obviously with the, uh, the work internationally that young people can find when they have degrees in these areas, um, teaching's not necessarily their first choice. And new for us, obviously, um, actually in just the past three years, is elementary teachers. Um, there's many of us that never thought that we'd ever get to the point where we didn't have enough elementary teachers to fill our needs. But as of three years ago, that has become a struggle for us. We hire about 100 elementary teachers every year, and um, it's getting harder and harder to find those. And so those are the areas that we um, work on in terms of our definition of hard to fill in Newport News. And then, of course, that last uh, priority of filling um, all of our vacancies. Um, last August, when we were preparing for your back-to-school report that we do for you every year, um, we surveyed our peers. Um, this was as of about the middle of August last year in terms of how is everybody doing. Um, and so when you look at these numbers, these are the number of teacher vacancies that each of the localities had, like I said, about mid-August last year. Um, when you look, we were doing okay, considerably for uh, comparing size and, and that kind of thing. However, as I said, we did um, start the school year with vacancies, which is not acceptable to us. All right. Um, from there, um, another key factor that plays into our need every year is our turnover rate. Um, this is showing you the teacher turnover rate for the last five years. Um, you can see several years ago we we uh, got some nice results, dropping our, our turnover rate by several percentage points for the last three years as that um, lack of uh, teacher pool continues to get worse and worse. Um, we have um, kind of been steady, which in my mind is not bad to remain steady at this point because there's such a high demand other places. And so you tend to have the opportunity for teachers to think the grass is green or somewhere else. But that's our turnover rate. And again, in comparison, um, you know, is 13% good, bad, or indifferent? Um, here I've shared with you um, what the national um, turnover rate is, um, as well as the national urban average. And as you can see, um, the national average is 17%, and of course for urban school divisions, it can be as high as 20%. So again, we're, we're, we're doing okay, but obviously not meeting the needs of our school division at this point. All right. So we've talked about what our priorities are and the needs that we have. Um, let's talk about this pool everybody talks about. Um, our teaching pool, um, for our teaching pool, we draw from uh, several different areas. Um, the one that most people are most familiar with, of course, is those newly licensed teachers coming from teacher prep programs at the universities. Um, we also get a good number of experienced teachers from other school divisions as well as with our military relocation and in general not only just military but relocations in general we get a lot of people moving to this area um, from other parts of the country so one piece of data i want to share with you um, is actually the percentage of novice teachers that we hire every year i think there's a little bit of a mis um, 
perception related to all of our te new teachers being new or novice. Um, and for us, that's not exactly true. Um, here are, you see the last four years and the percentage of novice teachers that we've hired. And you see kind of depending on the year, anywhere from only a third to a half of our teachers that we hire new to the division each year are actually coming to us with no experience. So that's not, that's not a bad thing. That's always good for us. Um, just means that we have to, to differentiate a little bit the work that we do with our new um, employees. Um, how you approach a novice teacher and how you work with an experienced teacher as they come into Newport News is gonna be slightly different. Um, student teachers, again, that's from our big novice group. Um, what I've provided you here is the data from five of the local universities, um, all of which we work with very closely. Uh, there's a couple of other smaller universities, but these five, when you look at the numbers here, what you're seeing is the number of student teachers that are produced at each of those universities over the last four years. And if you look at the 17, 18 school year, so that was the group of of student teachers that we would have hired from, um, there's only 500 there. Um, and if you remember, I told you I needed 275. Hmm. So 275 of the 500 doesn't leave much for anybody else. And so hence where that, competitive, that competition comes in trying to attract teachers to us rather than going to the other localities here. Okay. And as we talked about wanting to, to increase the minority teachers in our school divisions, one of the strategies that we use in HR to do that is to really work with the HBCUs. And what I'm sharing here is um, there are five HBCUs in the state of Virginia. These are the number of completers, or their student teachers, um, for um, last four years. Their data is always a year behind when we get it. But um, as you can see, the graduating class of 2017, there were only 60 student teachers at HBCUs across the state of Virginia. So again, that 60 is not going to put a dent in my need, much less the rest of the state. Okay. All right, so gives you a little bit of a picture of what our needs are, how we're, what priorities we're working on, and of course some of the barriers that are there for us. So let's talk a little bit about um, what we're doing, okay? Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of what the state's been doing, um, share a little bit of that, and this is going to only be a snapshot of, of many, many areas that they're working on. Um, but starting in 2016, um, the VDOE partnered with um, school divisions and universities um, to really kind of tackle this teacher shortage and retention issue that the state um, has been experiencing. And there have been many recommendations that have been made public as part of the, the work um, that that committee did and the work of the extension committees that were formed. Um, and tonight I'm just going to share a couple of the ones I pulled out. Um, all of these are either in the works now or being worked on actively or have been completed. And so let me tell you a little bit about some of them. One of the big changes is um, that the universities are now working on developing bachelor degree um, degrees in teaching. Um, up until this point, all programs across the state of the Divi uh, state of Virginia were master level programs. Um, everyone got a degree in something, and then if you were a secondary teacher, it would be in the subject area that you were teaching, and then you did a master's year um, to do your education classes and your student teaching. At the elementary level. You got a degree in something. My daughter's is in psychology. <laughs> um, and then that master's year is also then the education piece and the student teaching. Um, there's a drive because there are lots of barriers to the expense um, that are caused based on the expense of a college education. And so that's the driving force. If it's not about lowering expectations or any of those kinds of things but it is trying to um, eliminate barriers to some young people in terms of going into teaching. And so they have um, directed universities to develop these programs in, in elementary, for elementary teachers and for special education teachers. And so that's what's being worked on. Um, the last update I had is that hopefully there will be at least a handful of school uh, of universities that will have those programs where they'll start recruiting for them um, in the fall. One of the other things that the state has been doing is they have expanded their funding um, for programs that are actually intended to attract teachers into the, into the profession. 
Um, ODU has a Monarch, Monarch Teach program that's funded by the state that's intended to recruit um, young people that are interested in STEM areas. Um, residencies, the residency program we have, um, it's not state funded, but there are a couple out there that have received state funding and we're working on getting a piece of that too. Um, the Virginia Teach Scholarship and Loan Program, you may be familiar with that. They've expanded the amount of funding and how it's um, operated in the state of Virginia. Um, they've also increased the funding um, for incentives for STEM teachers once we get them. Um, and so they've increased that funding um, to help us with some of our hard to fill areas. Okay. The other thing they are doing, which we're all aware of, is working on the funding for compensation for our teachers. And the last area that I kind of pulled out of this was um, they have made uh, changes to the licensure regulations um, with the intent of trying to take some of the barriers out of the way in terms of paperwork or some of the requirements that didn't necessarily make sense anymore. It's the way we'd always done it, but is that really what's needed for a teacher to, to, to be successful in classrooms now? And so a couple of examples um, for military spouses, they took a lot of the um, paperwork out of the way and in fact at the state level they will accelerate any application for a military spouse. Um, I mentioned earlier the ability to add endorsements in a lot of areas um, by taking the praxis test or the assessment piece. Um, there's an experiential learner license. That's the one where you hear we get experts in the fields to come and be teachers with us and it's that's the license or the provisional license we use. They've uh, reduced the number of years of experience that are required for that one. Um, as well as um, giving school divisions the ability to ask for extensions for provisional license. So a teacher who was working on their getting going from their provisional to their full license in three years didn't quite get there, were able to request an extension. So again, some of those things that the state is working on with the universities and with the school divisions to try to address this. What you really want to know is what we're doing. So let me talk to you about what we're doing. Um, we're going to hit three big areas. I'm going to talk to you about the actual direct recruiting strategies we're using. I'm going to talk to you about some of what I call our grow our, grow our own strategies. And then finally, um, what our smart start for our new teachers is all about. And all of those are intentional recruiting strategies to help us. So um, as we look at the recruiting strategies, the first thing is a change in our hiring that um, we did about four years ago now. Um, this is a rather large school division, um, and in order to be able to get the number of teachers that we um, need, we have to be very efficient at our hiring. And so we made a change to a centralized interview process. Um, it is um, very favorable to the candidate, meaning that we're not running them around. If they're a high school candidate, they're not going to all five high schools to interview five different times. We do a centralized interview where um, we have principals on the team, we have our curriculum and development experts on the team, as well as our HR staff, um, and we do a centralized interview. Offers are made starting way back the first of the year, starting at that point, um, and the offers are made for them to teach in New Britain's public schools. So at that point, we don't know for sure where openings are or that kind of thing. Um, we've been very successful with it. It was a little bit of a change, um, as you can imagine, 22-year-olds are not quite sure about that, but, you know, we've worked with them um, and guaranteed, you know, that they will be happy with their placement. And then what happens is after we then know our allocations at our schools and um, we know who's leaving us, then the principals work to try to do, find um, those candidates that we've hired and who are the best fits. So it, it's a more efficient way of hiring, allows us to do it early, and allows us to make sure that we're getting the best candidates. Um, we do lots of recruiting trips. <laughs> um, anybody who wants to travel with us, let us know. Uh, we actually, um, this year, and we will finish with our actual tra travel at the end of the month. We have visited 34 colleges and universities at this point from Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, D.C., and Pennsylvania. Um, and we do on-site interviewing at those job fairs. So again, we're taking principals, we're taking curriculum people with us to make sure that we're able to not lose contact with the people that we, we meet um, at those university trips. Um, we've done events here. Um, we've done three events this year already. We did our um, open house back in the early part of February with the idea that we're trying to attract some other local teachers, uh, let people come and learn, us, learn about New Bernays Public Schools. We set up informational tables with principals, with curriculum people, all the programs we have, the magnets, 
really gives the people a chance to say, you know, I'm gonna come and check out Newport News and see if this is the place for me and really learn about it. And then followed by our interview expo later in the month, um, that interview expo, we actually hired 32 teachers on one Saturday morning. Um, and we just, this past Saturday, had another teacher uh, job fair um, in which we made 32 offers that morning and 20 of them accepted on the spot. So wow. we, efficiency is the key here. So um, those are the um, events we've had. We use lots of recruiting tools. You guys have heard of LinkedIn, uh, of course, all the social media, Facebook. We've actually, um, with our um, partnerships with the university across, uh, universities across the state, who are using their um, social media to make sure that um, our opportunities are shared. Um, Indeed, Career, career Builder, some of those um, regular ones, as well as um, we have a partnership with Troops to Teachers, as well as some traditional media advertising. Radio, we do a lot of radio actually. We get really good results from that, along with on, um, online news sources and of course the traditional print with press releases. And the last piece is incentives. So how do we get somebody to, to pick us or to go ahead and pull the trigger and say yes? Um, so we do um, several different types of incentives. Um, I don't want to give away all my secrets publicly, but um, we do do them around hard to fill areas, um, trying to do those early offers and getting people to accept. Um, we off something we do offer is employment in the summertime for our novices. So um, they come and work in Spark. It's a really great opportunity for them to come in and get some practice before they have their own full classroom. And so that's something that um, our candidates are telling is very attractive is to you know, it's a long time from finishing graduation and getting that first paycheck in September. So that's a, a very much a, an incentive. Um, we do have for our, those teachers we hire their own provisional licenses. We do a jump start program for tuition reimbursement. Um, you know, they have a lot of coursework to take along with assessments and it gets quite expensive. And so we have set aside tuition reimbursement funds to be able to assist with that. And the new thing that we are playing with is um, this year is some location um, reimbursement or relocation um, reimbursement. So working out some of the details on that. As we've been able to start really kind of extending um, our range for, the, for trips, um, North Carolina didn't used to be somewhere we really did a lot of recruiting because they had such a great strong um, state program um, that really kind of waived a lot of the um, uh, debt that they had from college as part of you know agreements to teach in the state well they've not been able to sustain that and so now we're back into new to north carolina and so that relocation um reimbursement is going to be something we're going to want to, to continue to work on um, next year as well to try to attract teachers okay so that's quick we're on those lots more details but um the other approach that we take is what we call our grow our own um, this is where we're really trying to create our own candidates and create our own young people that are going to go into teaching. Um, the first one on the list is Teachers for Tomorrow. Um, and with the um, help of school leadership and curriculum, we're ready to reintroduce Teachers for Tomorrow into our high schools next year. So we're very, very excited with that. Those programs involve some real instruction around um, teaching skills as well as internship and then a very conditional offer of employment course um, the goal is to stay connected with them as they go to university um, and provide some other experiences during that time um, the co college partnerships that we have um, you guys know that all of CNU student teachers come and do their, their um, student teaching with us um, which is a huge partnership I wish I could get the rest of them to do it but a um, little competition there but we will continue to work with all of our local universities and across the state um, we do a lot of webinars with them we do class meetings and um, with them we do mock interviews um, and provide practicums with the goal being that their students get to know about new produce public schools get to know the people that are here so that they will be interested in positions here with us um, ias our instructional assistants um, we have a lot of them who have worked very hard in our classrooms and decide they want to go into teaching so we do several things working with them um, to provide um, practicum experiences where they don't have to leave their site you know, in their work to do that. Um, we've done tuition reimbursement or continue to do that, along with even changing some assignments to make sure that they get the best experiences they can as they're going through their coursework. 
And the residencies, um, <coughs> as you know, I've talked to you about those before. We have two programs set up, one with Christopher Newport and one with ODU. The one with ODU is in special education. It's um, currently the only one in the state around special education. We designed that from scratch with them. I'm very pleased with that program. Um, and so the residents um, actually spend a year long paid co-teaching internship in our classrooms. Um, they get some help with their um, with scholarship money and then they then are guaranteed to work with us for at least three years afterwards. The really important part of that is what highly qualified new teachers we get out of something like that. The time in the classroom that they've spent during that internship is invaluable. Um, this year we have eight residents, uh, three elementary, uh, one secondary English and four are in the special ed program with um, ODU and we um, anticipate um, increasing that um, that number another 50% next year. So. All right, and the last piece of our plans revolves around the opportunities that we provide for support for new teachers. When we go out recruiting and we ask um, student teachers, you know, what questions they may have about our school division, the number one thing they ask are what supports do you have for a new teacher? They want to know how they're going to get the help they need to be successful. And so hence we put a lot of effort in this area. Um, in the, so let me go through a couple of the pieces. The first one, and we call it our Smart Start program, um, it involves uh, summer opportunities. So I talked a few minutes ago about um, the opportunity to work in Spark and do some practice in the summer. Um, we also have um, our course, our uh, Learning and Leading Academy that goes on in the summer, all of our professional development that we have for our teachers. Um, we open that immediately up to all of our new hires. Um, in fact, they get personal calls from the curriculum department encouraging them to participate in making recommendations about what might be, you know, good sessions for them to attend. Um, and we even have one week during the summer that all of the PD that goes on that week is a poor new teacher specifically. Um, so a pretty intensive program there. We also offer what we call a new teacher welcome center. We have one at each of our levels. Um, it's intended to have a small group setting for new teachers to come and work with one of our experts to talk about the technology that's available in Newport News, what does the classroom look like. They're held at our Spark site so they can go do some classroom visits um, along with um, some basics about the curriculum and basically in a small group for them to start asking some questions that they have and what, what worries them at this point. From there we go to our welcome week. Um, this year we will actually extend that two more days. So they will have seven days of pre-service, what we call pre-service time before the rest of the teachers come back. Um, and that includes of course the breakfast and the welcome from you guys, um, as well as um, more sessions from academic services and of course the school-based work that they are doing during that time. Leads on into mentors. We assign all of our new teachers mentors, the lead teachers, as well as our new teacher induction coordinators. So at the school level, you're having lots of people focusing on the needs of new teachers, which is what they like to hear. And the last piece is the teacher coaches. We have teach, new, uh, new teacher coaches at the elementary level, something very unique to Newport News Public Schools. And it's not just for those new teachers that are having problems or experiencing issues right away. It takes any of our, all of our new teachers and really walks them through that coaching cycle and gives them the support they need. Um, the New Teacher Academy is their monthly professional development that runs through the first year. And our plans for next year is to continue that to year two. And finally, again, I mentioned the jumpstart tuition reimbursement. That's the kind of things that they like to hear in terms of support. All right, so that's recruiting. And then real quickly for retention, um, you know, the National Learning Policy Institute um, is a big national group that does a lot of research um, about lots of different things, but specifically they've been working on um, the teacher shortage issue and retention of teachers. And there's three things that they really say make a difference when you're trying to recruit and, and retain teachers. Their compensation, which we've talked about, uh, teacher preparation and development, and teaching conditions. And so, with that research base, what I want to talk about are some of the things that we've got going on that really kind of target those areas. Um, compensation and benefits, you know, we're working very hard to tr try to be competitive with y'all's help. Thank you very much. Um, and, and you may have heard me say before, um, it's not all about compensation for um, teachers, um, but it can take you out of the game. And so, um, 
it's and as you look at our experienced teachers you know that grass will certainly look greener um, somewhere else if that includes better pay as well so again both at the beginning level pay and um, all the way through our scale it's very important to be competitive um, the development piece we do as I mentioned we are extending our new teacher Academy to two years um, the work that we're doing building professional learning communities is a huge development piece for our teachers and so very important to that retention of course um, through curriculum and development Angelette's um, group the constant professional development that's provided to all of our teachers um, and something that we haven't talked about before which I think is um, is, is just as important is the working conditions um, and we don't talk about that much um, but uh, there's a couple of big areas here that do make a difference for teachers and when you hear about why they either choose somewhere or they choose to leave, leave somewhere um, some of these working conditions um, revolve around the resources so what kind of material resources are available to a teacher to help them the curriculum strong curriculum we have the instructional supplies the technology that's available both software and hardware those are the material resources that make a difference for teachers in the working environment also the additional human resources that we have if you think about our schools and the additional um, in, uh, roles that we have that are intended to support students and therefore also support teachers and, and their ability to teach kids our counselors our coaches our interventionists all of those additional human resources are very important and that feeds into the working conditions in our schools and of course the physical plant itself like we were just talking about that earlier um, and so that is very important and those are the things that really make a difference in terms of re recruiting and retaining teachers what does the school plant look like um, the cleanliness the the um, just the environment itself um, and what's available in those plants so those are some things that we're doing um, and you and you're very aware of the work that you're kind of working for for all of those areas and so I think I'm at questions. <laughs> and I do want to say this particular picture is a group of our, um, as our employment team in the Human Resources Department. So this is our team that focuses on employment. We have several other members as well in our HR team. But this was taken on Saturday when we made those 32 offers on Saturday morning. So, Ms. Holmes, thank you for your report. Uh, Mr. Ely, I think I have a question for you. Um, not a question, just a comment. I just want to say thank you for the extensive report that you gave us I definitely see the growth <laughs> from when I first came on the board to now with the diversity of reaching out to all the universities asking them you know for their student teachers um, so that's definitely a, a great effort and how we've been recruiting far as male teachers how has that come along yes sir <laughs> um, yes and that's another thing that we look at um, when we're, we're traveling to see um, we try to ask for information about the programs and the and the participants so that we can make sure that we try to to go after male teachers um, they laugh at me in the office they'll be doing an interview in a conference room and I'll see a male teacher walk by and I'm jumping up to see what happened did we make an offer did we, you know, it's a little over the top sometime but yeah it is also just just like with our more minorities it's you know I think it's as much about attracting all all anyone we can find into the teaching profession and right. then of course working on on our minority hires and our male hires so well, yeah it's not very high yeah I know it's, it's been um, difficult across the state I um, have assisted it in the education field. She said just how hard it is to have mm -hmm. male teachers is, is just become a hard, but I'm not going into that field. But just thanks again for reaching out to, of course, for the minorities, Hampton University and Norfolk State and Virginia State, some of the few that's in the area, and continue to do the good work. And hopefully over the years, we will continue to see that pattern go of more minority teachers in the school division. Thank you. We will. Uh, Ms. Jones. Wonderful report. Um, Sure. Um, and specifically with word language is targeting word language but I'm also hoping like the same thing happens across the board with all your subjects when you're hiring them do you assess their ability or their either their ability to speak the language or their knowledge in the specific language or whatever discipline you're hiring them for yes that's the value of having those centralized teams um, interview teams is that um, our uh, curriculum supervisor um, or one of um, our lead teachers that speaks that particular language we're interviewing for serves on those teams so they're able to do at least a minute at least a little bit of a language check um, it's kind of interesting to sit on those and have the the curriculum supervisor start speaking in Spanish and you know 
uh, when you don't speak Spanish, especially. So, <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you. Anyone, uh, Ms. Simons. Um, thank you very much for that report. I was a teacher myself, and I remembered really enjoying the camaraderie and the mentorship and all of that that I feel like you all are building to welcome new teachers. It makes it much less scary to start a new job <laughs> when you feel like you're coming into a team. Uh, I, I have an idea for Spark. Okay. So I know we have a lot of high school students that will volunteer. And I think that you all should like make that a program where you talk about the teaching profession mm -hmm. and you have some meetings and maybe <laughs> give them brochures for like the universities that actually have the teaching <laughs> programs and, and, and kind of get grow yeah. your own and try Absolutely. to inspire some of our high school kids to yes. go into teaching and come back and, and have it be a tour of the teaching profession kind of summer. Right, absolutely, because the Teachers for Tomorrow program, we will actually have those students work in Spark as well, but they're already showing an interest, and so mm -hmm. yeah, to get another captured audience would be great as mm -hmm. they're working with kids in the summer. So it's yeah. a great idea, thank you. Um, um, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, I have um, just about uh, three questions. And uh, first, I want to comment. This is a really excellent presentation, and I tell you that the portion that I appreciated the, the most was our comparison of ourselves to state national averages, our comparison of ourselves to other divisions around. Uh, that shows a, a great level of introspection and ability to see where we are and where we want to go. So I appreciate uh, having that information. Uh, you mentioned the there was a national institute. I, I didn't catch the rest of it, but mm -hmm. they put out a, a policy memo. And um, what's the name of that institute? And This is the uh, National Learning Policy Institute. National Their Learning. website is great, absolutely great. This is the um, report um, on teacher supply and demand and shortages. Um, this is the state report that was done around the work that I showed you. So this is also on the VDOE website. So there's lots of good information in both of those reports. Great, and can we, uh, would you uh, supply a copy, uh, electronic copy to the, to the board? I would, I would appreciate the um, opportunity to read it. Um, uh, read both of those. One of the things you mentioned as a as a takeaway was uh, um, the quality professional development, uh, and I I underlined the word quality. Did was there anything in the report that outlined what quality professional development means um, that or best practices that you took away? Um, just let me pull some of the things from the National Institute. Um, they focused a lot on the preparation programs at the universities. It was one big piece of it. Um, the other pieces, a lot of what they talk about with the development is um, in terms of satisfaction of teachers that are in the profession is the need for quality professional development for them to continue and grow within their professional profession and feel like they've got real meaning in their role. And so that's mainly what they've talked about. Um, they also talk about um, strong and high quality induction programs. So that's our new teacher um, programs that are there. So the importance for mentors in the same field, um, having time to work together, the mentor and the new teacher, um, and um, really making it a structured program. Okay. And uh, last question uh, was around the hard to fill hiring spot. I really uh, like this slide uh, because it, it shows uh, where it does shift. And I think when I first started on the board, elementary was not quite such a, um, yes. uh, an emergent or urgent need. And, and now it is. Uh, have we, in the past, I've, I mentioned this, uh, I've, I've talked about this before, uh, had a hard to fill bonus. Um, and uh, hard to fill, so essentially a hard to fill bonus pool, like I'm mm -hmm. uh, looking at this, is about 188 in there. So uh, let's say a, a fund of $200,000 that would uh, pay a bonus to the hard to fill spots. And then as, um, as the percentage of those teachers migrate out, uh, as, as they fill in, then so another group would migrate in, but essentially a revolving fund that would every year pay the hard to fill spots uh, so then we can close that retention gap. 
Um, we have we do pay um, a signing bonus for our hard to fill area, so we do at the initial point of hire. Um, the state has been providing for um, our STEM areas, which is also inclusive of a lot of our hard to fill areas. They've been providing us funds to be able to do um, kind of a stay bonus um, for those teachers for the first five years. Um, we have. Uh, researched we've discussed we've kind of tried to work through that concept of um, paying those kinds of bonuses to our current teachers there's a lot of factors that play into that I mean just one example is at middle school a lot of our middle school teachers have multiple endorsements and so principals decide which subject area that they're going to you know actually teach in and so sometimes that causes some mm -hmm. angst and some um, uh, very unhappy teachers if I've decided that your best is English but and you're endorsing math and if I put you in the math classroom you could get that extra money it just makes it hard sometimes to make good leadership decisions with that extra factor and so that's just one of the barriers that we've kind of been up against um, we, we continue to study it every year and try to look at what are some ways to try to work on the retention piece of those hard to fill areas so we're still working on that okay. um, um. No, she, no, she, go ahead. No, Miss 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 Jones, and then we'll have Dr. Beck, we and then we'll have uh, Miss Charles. Um, it's actually just a really good yeah. comment off of um, what Miss Simon said earlier about the Spark idea. This past summer, I entered not through Spark, but through Career Pathways, mm -hmm. um, and we interacted very closely with the Spark interns. We were doing the same job, and um, I found that I could not be a teacher based off that experience, <laughs> but I have many peers who discovered their love of teaching yeah, because of that experience, so that, that those programs, just so that you guys don't already <laughs> tend to weed out those potential teachers or the students who think they could be teachers, it solidifies that, and the students right. who think they might not solidifies <laughs> that, too. So it does do a little bit of that. That's also common. I had to say based off of what Ms. Simon said. You're right, exactly right. <laughs> okay, um, Dr. Bess. Okay, I would like to um, commend you for an excellent report as well. Thank you. I just have a couple of points. Um, I would like to commend um, the efforts put into recruitment because um, I know it's, it's, it's hard and, and people actually have choices now. They, they yeah. have options, they have lots of options. Um, but the support I think is really, really good because we know how hard First year teachers mm -hmm. really struggle, and I think many people have absolutely no idea. So I really like the support that they will be um, receiving. I have a question regarding the teacher residency program. Mm -hmm. Are the um, cooperating teachers? Are they? I know they receive professional development points, and is there a stipend yes, um, available with that as well? I yes, think that's it is. It's a full year program, so we've um, doubled what our clinical faculty get for the whole year. Um, so they get only the, not only the professional development, but they also get um, a good size um, supplement for their work. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and the help of the classroom. <laughs> so. uh, Ms. Searles Laws. Well, thank you um, for such a comprehensive presentation. I think the part I did enjoy the most was um, the robust, uh, you know, recruiting efforts. I had no idea um, that you guys have to do that much to get the teachers that we get. So that kind of leads into um, the next two things. Um, I was recently at a community college, a local community college, and I just was wondering if we do recruiting there for them to, you know, consider they're at the end of that two-year degree and then seeing what mm -hmm. a four-year could do for teachers. Yes, we, we actually work with Thomas Nelson. Um, we go and spend time in the education. They, they can take, I think it's two of the basic level intro education classes at Thomas Nelson. Um, they have a great relationship with ODU, so most of their students will um, okay. transition to ODU program. And we actually have been working very hard. ODU has hoped to get enough students coming out of Thomas Nelson that they can really teach almost a whole program at the Peninsula Center, and which would be wonderful for us. Um, and so, yes, we, we've been working very closely with them. Oh, well, I'm excited to hear about that. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one, other question is, is it safe to assume um, that our turnover rate correlates to our hard to fill positions? Is that where our turnover is in those hard to fills or is it someplace else? 
Um, that's a big chunk of it. As you saw, the special education and math numbers, I mean, in the secondary level, that's a big chunk of the teachers. Um, you know, between the two, it's over 50 teachers every year that we're hiring in just those two areas. Yeah, the elementary is another 100. And so, yeah, I mean, I think when you look at mm -hmm. where our turnover is, that's that's where the need is. Um, we do have, I mean, there are other, other, other areas that are starting to kind of poke their heads out and say, hey, we're, you know, it's harder to get teachers. Um, I think that's more directly related just to the pool in general not being as large. Um, but yes. Well, thanks for moving us forward. <laughs> thank you. Um, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, great uh, uh, briefing. Uh, do you think the hard to fill positions, say special education, um, is because of probably, you know, we get our 22 year old teacher and we thrust them in that environment with, you know, with the youth that are you know, transitioning emotionally and things of this nature. Do you think that has something to do with it? Um, well, I think there's a couple of factors involved there. Um, you know, when I mentioned that the state is um, having the universities put a bachelor program together right. for special right. education, um, one of the things, especially locally here, ODU, um, and we Mary are the two that here locally that have special education programs. Okay. The ODU program, um, the master's program there was just really intensive. Okay. I mean, it took easily a year and a half, almost two years for a lot of them to finish their programs. So I think, again, that cost barrier um, was a big deal for a lot of, of young people. Um, William and Mary has tried to work on doing some dual endorsements. So, you know, we'll, we're seeing more um, graduates coming from there with like an English and a special, special okay. education endorsement coming out. Um, so they're working on that, but I think that really was a big cost. Okay. Um, and then um, we, we talk about this all the time. Our special educators really kind of have two jobs. Yeah, they right, have the teacher right, yeah, job right. and then they have the compliance piece. Right. And so it's a tough job. Right. I mean, it really is. Mm -hmm. um, just the added, you know, compliance yeah. piece is, is difficult. So. Okay. Well, it's obvious that the state has, um, you know, saw this issue of teaching shortage because I was surprised about all of the things that they are doing, mm -hmm. which is which is actually great. And normally change, actually, sometimes, majority of the change, especially socially, uh, normally comes from, you know, the top. It comes, well, well, some grassroots, but the actual policy changes come from mm -hmm. the state and the federal government. Uh, so, I, you know, just from that action alone, um, it may take a couple of years to, you know, turn the curve where mm -hmm. people get back into teaching. Um, some of the best recruiters in the world are military recruiters, <laughs> and, and, and they're, they're good for a reason. Um, a lot of people think it's more incentive, eh, maybe, you know. Um, it, is, it is actually, they use uh, what they call the buddy system, the peer mm -hmm. system, the uncle, the aunt, the mother, the grandparent. So they actually work on those individuals actually before they work on the recruit. Uh, so they had a system, they had a system in place about 15, 16 years ago where I was still in the service at the time where they would actually contact all of the retirees and they sent them a letter and said, Hey, guess what? You know, if you show up with little Johnny at the recruiting station and he or she makes it through basic training, you get a $1,500 bonus mm -hmm. or you get 1500 bucks. In fact, it worked so well that they had to shut the program down in about, in about a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so and, and, and I commend you on all the work you're doing uh, because it is all about recruiting and, uh, who, you know, who has, the, who has the best hook, you know. So just think about that, you know, maybe we can reach out to some of those other individuals mm -hmm. that, that has control over, over our future teachers. All right, all right thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Ms. Atoll. Mitchell, I think you gave us a, a wonderful report, and I think yeah, we've asked report. you gave us another report on all the interests that you've answered for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, thank you very much. If there's no more questions, okay. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, um, we'll move the agenda to item uh, 4.02, the proposed textbooks adoption. I think uh, Miss Nancy Sweat, I think she's going. You will give us an update and evaluation Absolutely. and selection process. Yes. Good evening, Chairman Hunter, Vice Chair mm -hmm. Brown, uh, Dr. Parker, and members of the board. Mm -hmm. um, it's an exciting time for me and instruction to bring you a um, proposed adoption for our new math textbooks. Um, so to begin with, I'd like you to know a little bit about the history of why we choose to adopt books. <laughs> the state has a seven-year cycle of um, 
revising their standards. And so oftentimes when we, they revise their standards, we find that we need to revise or adopt a new textbook. Sometimes the standards aren't changed drastically and we can keep our same resources. But at the same time, every seven years, the state gives us an approved list. So they did that year, this year to match the new standards in math that were released in 2016. What happens is we look forward, of course, we're revising our curriculum, and then we look to their approved list to initiate our adoption, which is what we did this year. When we adopt textbooks, as you've heard before, we always make sure that they're going to serve the standards and that they're also, in Newport News, going to serve the college career and citizen ready skills. Particularly in math, that would be critical in critical thinking, problem solving, and communication, which are also process skills in mathematics as indicated by the State Department. So I want to give you a little bit of the timeline. The timeline is that we started in January with the state list. The state gave us about five to six vendors in the state um, that are approved textbooks. So we began with that process and we worked with that until April, which is right now when I'm presenting to you. We also had a period of public review. The public review was here in this building as well as in our different schools. And we had a committee that we brought together teachers, leaders, and administrators. The vendors came in and did presentations. We had time with the books prior to the presentations. And then we used a rubric, which is the next part here. We used a rubric in evaluating those resources. When we evaluate, we have a very prescribed rubric, and it helps us evaluate, does it fill the needs of the standards? Does it fill the needs of the college career and citizen ready skills? Does it give us rich digital online textbooks and online resources, both for our students and our teachers? And then all of these other points, does it support the content? Is it sound best mathematical practices? Does it support planning for our teachers and support in the classroom? Does it give us options for formative and summative assessments that the teachers can use in the classroom? Do our teachers feel that it is well organized and kind of easy and intuitive to use? And are there resources included that are good for all levels of learning in case we are accelerating learning or in case we are slowing it down for some intervention? So that's the rubric we use in all of our evaluation of textbooks. So I'm proud to bring you tonight that in our K-5 program, our committee has opted to go with Great Minds Eureka Math. And that is um, a set of books, both for the teacher and the student. It comes with some online resources. It doesn't come with a full online textbook because again, these are our elementary students and they need a physical book in front of them. It also comes with some consumable materials for our students that are so important to them as they work through a book that they can take home and back and forth in their book bag and actually write in. Um, some special programs that our teachers can use um, in centers with their, Chromes, with their Chromebooks or with their iPads that we have in some of our primary grades. And our teachers really felt like this was the best alignment to our standards with the support that they wanted and with a real emphasis on conceptual understanding. Because math now is not about, and it hasn't been for some years, about finding the right answer, but it is very much about the process and the conceptual understanding of how to manipulate that math. So that is our selection that we've made in elementary that I hope you will approve for us next month. And in middle school, sorry, double click there. In middle school, we went with um, a resource called Big Ideas. And the big ideas, again, it comes from the state approved list. It was one of six that we evaluated. Um, and we've selected, our teachers have selected this resource for middle school and high school. So there's a nice um, consistency because sometimes we find that our teachers are switching um, schools at the same time. And our students will also be very familiar with one book and its layout from year to year. Um, this is a book that we can use in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and of course, Algebra One for the Algebra One students that are in middle school. If we have geometry students, on the next slide you'll see geometry. We'll make those books available for middle school too. What we love about this book um, is that it comes as a bundle. So we get a full online textbook for every student, and we also get a physical copy for our students. 
So regardless of what their needs are at the time, they will have the resources in front of them that they need. Um, as I said, high school went with the same uh, proposal, big ideas, algebra, algebra one, geometry, and algebra two. Um, again, I'd just like to reiterate our rationale, our teacher's rationale for going with these books was that um, the first rationale was that they found that it was a, of strong curriculum support. Again, going back to the standards and the college career and citizen ready skills. They also believed that it was great opportunity for rigor, to bring rigor into the classroom because all of our students should have the privilege of rigor. It is not just for AP, it is not just for your higher level students. All students deserve to be challenged and we felt these resources did that. Critical thinking is huge in mathematics, giving them the opportunity to do that and giving them some practice and structures for that. Digital resources that are rich for the student and the teacher and also lots of assessment um, resources. And that's quick, immediate in time resources, kind of formatively daily, but also larger summative pieces that teachers can use as well. Um, as far as our implementation timeline, we would like um, we are asking for your approval in May. Then we would order the textbooks and we would get them delivered sometime throughout the summer. Um, in August, we would have our professional development. We would also, um, that's, it's very important to schedule that because our vendors actually come and do some of that PD with us instead of just all of it homegrown. Um, and then we begin to revise our curriculum and that is a multi-year process. So that as we're getting to know the books and as we're getting the very important feedback from our teachers on what resources are the most important and which are the most useful for them and then we are already anticipating next on the line is the standards revision we are expecting science a new science curriculum framework from the state this year it's likely to not be until 2020 in the spring of 2020 at that same time they will release a new science approved science textbook um, and we'll find if the change in standards demand that we also revise our um, adopt a new science textbook at that time and that's it do you have any questions for me uh, mr brown yes uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of online resources um, you mentioned not all of the tech there's there are online resources for the elementary school level but uh, not all of it's online can you describe um, what i'm getting at is in terms of uh, homework and worksheets one of the great frustrations I had with my own uh, kids in the, at the elementary school level was, I know you have a worksheet, and I can see it in your agenda. It was assigned. Where is it? Worksheet never made it home. So I already knew, <laughs> already knew that before I asked the question, but still had to go through that whole routine anyways. Uh, if the resource was available online, and that was always the frustration, we could download the worksheet, print it out at home, and then, and then go through it. So is, is there materials like that available? There, there are. Okay. What, I, what I wanted to indicate was that the full textbook is not available like it is in middle and high school. I think in uh, what you're gonna see in our elementary schools is our students are actually going home with the textbook that is consumable. So it won't be a single piece of paper, it will be the entire math book, and then the students will be able to see, oh, these are the, these are the parts I need to do for homework possibly, but then here are the pages that we reviewed in class and here's the work that I did last night all there in the same resource okay but there are online resources for our elementary most of that will be um, instructional support and some um, center activities that the teachers can use and then lots of support for teachers um, for example instructional materials that teachers can use during instruction that is online but not so much a coded online textbook for our elementary students. Okay. Uh, and then to follow up, uh, another question was around the, um, I'm a big advocate for the art of problem solving uh, because it's, it's the uh, text and curriculum that goes along with the American mathematics competition. So that's a, 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 big, a, a big goal of mine. There is a, uh, they have a set of textbooks for each of the levels. So uh, at each of the uh, subject areas and the levels, there's a set of essentially supplementary textbooks. Um, because we're considering adopting some textbooks, and these are great supplemental materials that um, allow math, supplement math clubs, allow a teacher to give a, a, a gotcha kind of a question on a test and, and other resources that we considered, or looking at that 
to go along with um, this set of textbooks? We did not. Um, we are we were bound by the Virginia state approved list, and we found that those these two resources, these two textbook companies were so rich in supplement that we didn't need to go beyond that. Okay. Um, it is something we can look at, but it would need to be, to use our textbook funds, it would need to be on that state approved list. Gotcha. Okay. Ms. Cheryl Flores. Well, thank you for the presentation. Sure. I would love it if maybe at our next session, if we could just have copies of the books so we could see them. Okay. Just for review, I yeah. was going to bring some to you, but it's it's uh you don't have to bring all of them yeah i was gonna say it's like 14 gra 13 grades so yeah no yeah. no okay, just absolutely. a sample of the the two maybe sure the, the elementary and the one that's uh maybe one that would be for the high school that would go down to the middle absolutely that would be really great okay. thank you no worries any other questions uh miss bet thank you for the report thank you very much Ooh, thank you okay On next on our agenda, uh, 5.03, we have the attendance report, 5.04, the membership report, 5.05, construction report. Uh, those were all part of your package. If there's no questions, then we'll move on to item number 506, a comment by the superintendent, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> before, I, before I begin my formal report, uh, I just wanted to, it just dawned on me, I didn't have any remarks about uh, the National School Board Conference in Philadelphia, and I know some of you probably will, will speak to that, but uh, just, it was my first time attending uh, that conference, and I was really um, in awe of the quality of the uh, workshops, work sessions, uh, professional presentations uh, of that of the National School Board Conference, and I appreciate the board uh, making this a priority to attend on an annual basis. Uh, I think we brought back several very good ideas uh, from that conference, and it was just a very good time for professional development and uh, and networking and and, uh, and 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 bonding as a as a team. So thank you for for providing that opportunity, um, Mr. Chair. I would like to begin my remarks by thanking our community staff and other supporters for their support of our budget this year. I think uh, we will continue to work with, in collaboration with our city as we. Um, uh, attempted to do so today to ensure that our school division has the financial resources to ensure that our students graduate college and career and citizen ready. Um, I think that we are, it's incumbent on us to continue to, to be clear, uh, professional, and transparent in our communications moving forward with, uh, with our city leadership. I think they, they, uh, they, I think they respect that and I also feel that they appreciate that. Now, I think bridges can be formed and uh, can be built and, and, and uh, alliances can, can work out when both uh, groups understand each other, and uh, I applaud the board today for taking for being vocal at the um, at the uh, work session today with our city leaders. I thought it was a positive meeting, and I think a lot of good information got out uh, on both from both sides of the table. So thank you very much for that. On Saturday, I attended the 100 Black Men of Virginia Peninsula's uh, annual Black Tie Gala. This group of men perform great work in our community. They serve as mentors to boys and girls across the peninsula, including dozens of students in Newport News. During the event, they also presented scholarships to several of our deserving high school seniors. Um, I'd like to formally thank the 100 black men of the peninsula for all they do to support our students. Uh, last week was National Assistant Principals Week. Um, our assistant principals are an important part of our leadership team, uh, working alongside principals to ensure our students are successful. Newport News is fortunate to have such a talented group of educators and possibly future principals. Uh, we thank them for their support of our students and staff. Uh, this month is also National Autism Awareness Month, and there are numerous community events taking place around April to increase understanding and acceptance and foster um, the support of children and adults with autism. Newport News Public Schools has a wide range of resources to support and advance students, so I thank uh, all of our dedicated staff who, who serve our students, uh, our autistic students in the community. This month is also the National Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Month, and I have my blue pinwheel on my on my lapel here, uh, and participated in uh, some events uh, uh, helping assisting students in planting the blue pinwheels that you'll see around the city at some of our schools. Uh, I had the fortune to uh, visit um, the Silent Garden, uh, located on the corner of Warwick Boulevard and J. Clyde Morris Boulevard, where we also planted uh, blue pinwheels, 2,000 blue pinwheels. Uh, the national symbol of hope, health, and safety, and colorful silhouettes representing our children. 
I also attended the ceremony at Denby Early Childhood Center and enjoyed uh, participating in that special project with the kids painting, pin, um, planning pinwheels as well with uh, the, uh, Mrs. Uh, Price uh, and a few other delegate uh, council members as well. Let me see, three Newport News programs were selected for inclusion in the VSBA 2019 Showcases for Success directory. That's some very good news. Um, Lattes and Literacy, a monthly themed professional development session focused on improving student literacy. Our middle school human trafficking curriculum, the Prevention Project, which is a joint venture with, New, with Richmond Justice Initiative that gives our students a deeper understanding of what human trafficking is and how to protect themselves and the New Teacher Institute, an initiative designed to support the unique learning needs of first grade, uh, first year teacher, excuse me. Congratulations to Dewana Cooper, Amy Jones, and Angela Rett for leading these initiatives. Thank you. The directory was distributed throughout the state and is available online. So great things happening in Newport News. Sorry to, to take that from you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, there are three events coming up that our student families and communities are invited to attend. Uh, upcoming events include the, um, Saturday, April 20th, the Kicking It to Violence Kickball Tournament. And the Community Block Party will be held at one th from 1.30 to 5.30 at Todd Stadium. Students and staff will battle it out on the field. There will also be a superhero contest and carnival games. So come on out Saturday, April 20th. This event is presented by the Citywide SCA and is the culminating activity of our, uh, for Violence Prevention Week. Uh, a family forum and empowerment fair will be held on Saturday, April 27th from 11 to 2 at Heritage High School. I invite you to join me in a discussion about education. The event will also include games, displays, door prizes, free haircuts, I can, I can need that, free groceries, and free lunch. This event is sponsored by our Family Engagement Specialist and the Lambda Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. And finally, the Student Advisory Group on, on Education is hosting a high school expo at Patrick Henry Mall on Saturday, May 4th from 11.30 to 2.30 p.m. Students from each high school will showcase our schools, programs, and how they become college, career, and citizen ready. They will, the expo will also feature student performances in the food court area and art show. <laughs> so I invite everyone to join us for the expo on May 4th. So that concludes my announcements, Mr. Uh, my comments, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Uh, thank you. We'll move the agenda to item number seven. Are there any cards? Well, at this point, we do have two gentlemen, uh, young men in the back. Um, they're Boy Scout Troop. From uh, troop number 158 to Hidewood Boulevard, I would ask if they both could come front and um, introduce them, introduce themselves, their brothers. They are uh, these two uh, young men are both are working on their communications marriage badge. So please come forward, introduce yourself to us, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, uh, hello. Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is Keeper Tafali, and this is my brother, Satirius Tafali, and uh, we're working on a communications merit badge. Uh, it was nice to be here tonight. Yeah. What, your grade, school? Oh, uh, I'm in seventh grade. My brother's in ninth grade. I go to Gildersleeve, and my brother goes to Medgeville. Okay. Thank Welcome. Good to see you guys. Did, did you... I'm Satirius Tafali. <clears throat> I'm from Troop of, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he basically said everything. <laughs> well, good. Well, let me tell you, I'm going to give you, I used to be in a boys club, uh, Boy Scouts, many, 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 many years ago. So I'm going to tell you, it's been a long evening. I know you've been to school today. And uh, thank you for staying here for the entire meeting. So I want to give you a round of applause. Good luck in uh, getting this communication uh, merit badge, and uh, mm -hmm. thanks again for being here. And who's with you in, in the back? That's your dad. That's your dad? <laughs> dad, please stand up and be recognized. <laughs> again, uh, thank you both and dad for bringing you here tonight, and again, good luck, mm -hmm. and uh, wish you well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Okay. I uh, guess we, uh, we have um, last... Next to last, we have matters by the school board. And up first, we'll have Ms. Jones. 
They were awesome and informative. Um, I would also like to offer my congratulations, so I believe it was Ms. Pat Franklin and Mr. Mercier um, on that award when it comes to the music, having the best um, music community. It really, truly is amazing. I'm not sure um, how many of you guys or how many teachers and administrators realize that, but coming from the students, um, just to put a little bit in perspective, at District Choir every year, this year, Woodside alone had over 44, had 44 students make district choir out of entire District 8. That's not counting the other high schools that made it. And it's consistent. Um, Newport News has consistently shown across all music disciplines how amazing the teachers and the students are. Um, Summer Institute of the Arts is a great example. Without it, I would not have had such an amazing appreciation for music that I do. And it's not just the programs, it's the teachers. I go to Woodside and I went to Dozier and go to sleep, but I've been influenced by teachers at Menchville, Crittenden, Heritage, Warwick, everywhere. They truly are a community and they really make an effort to instill that sense of community and belonging no matter what school a student goes to, what grade they're in. And I just really want to commend NNPS on building such an amazing community and building such a love of music, not just in me, but in students in general. Um, I would also like to again highlight the Sage Expo, which is Saturday, May 4th, um, and just a couple more details. So it does it does run from 11:30 to 2:30. Um, however, that's well; those are the arts exhibits and the um, student exhibits. From 12 to 2, we will have student performances in the food court. So we invite the entire community to come out and attend and see what Newport News Public Schools high schools are high school students um, are doing. Thank you, guys. And for, that's all my comments for tonight. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, Dr. Bess. Good evening. I have Good just a couple of remarks. Um, I had an opportunity to speak with moms and muffins at Crittenden Middle School. Uh, very, it was a packed house, just a very nice um, event. And it just brought back again for me. Sometimes we think middle school uh, students, they, they don't want their parents to come out, but they really do. And they were waiting patiently and waiting for my mom. Don't get started yet. But it was just a wonderful um, event. And they're doing some great things at Crittenden Middle School. Also had an opportunity uh, to attend the uh, recognition banquet to honor those uh, people that have served years in Newport News Public Schools, and it was just an honor to to be there and to see those people that have dedicated those years, and those are people that have given blood, sweat, and tears, and and they are very proud of the work that they have done, um, and I was glad to be a part of that um, as well. Had an opportunity to attend the first, um, my first school board, National School Board Association Conference. And one of the things that stood out about me, I met people from all over the United States, and I would tell them I was a school board member from Newport News, Virginia. And probably eight times out of ten, they could tell me something about Newport News, Virginia. So that made me feel so good and also like to commend the board members that have gone to that conference before me and the presenters because evidently they're spreading the word about the great things that Newport News Public Schools um, are doing. But last but certainly not least, um, we're, we're, we're working and we're praying to get this budget I'm um, taken care of and I just want the community and those Huntington alumni people to know we have not forgotten about Huntington. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bass. Uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually wish I could have been there, but <laughs> I, w I was having back surgery that week. And uh, that, as I was telling my colleagues here, you know, half of the people that took care of me in, at the Navy Portsmouth Hospital, uh, not half of them, but all of them had went to public schools. Uh, a couple went to public schools here in Newport News, Virginia. Um, you know, just to highlight the success uh, of those individuals, especially when your, your life is in their hand or your quality of life is, is in their hand. So 30 days later, you know, I, I feel good, I feel great. Thank, you, thank everybody for their prayers. Uh, we're attending a meeting today, and I, I want to commend the superintendent on, well, I'm not going to say performance, but I'm going to say, you know, he actually ran a class today. I, I think I think people had to learn something. Uh, you can't, you couldn't have sat in that room today uh, and not learn something from what he said. I mean, even I did, and and I, you know, and I know what where, where he was coming from. But you, uh, uh, a great job. Um, I think it was a force to be reckoned with. I think the everybody in earsight know that this uh, board is committed 
uh, to receiving our fair due. I think they understand that we are committed to our children. Um, and I think they know that we will continue down this path. Um, so my board, some of my board members have, you know, calmed me down a little bit. So Mr. Harris, let's see the process work out. So I've sort of kept it zipped up. Uh, but I, I really commend you. I commend the board uh, for the questions that you had and the comments that you had. Uh, so I am just pleased to serve with these individuals. Uh, so I have all the confidence in the world uh, that uh, they will see the return on investments, which is actually exactly what it is. Uh, so that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, Mrs. Simons. Um, I want to thank everyone for the reports. It's really good to know what we're doing to recruit teachers. Um, there is a teacher shortage in the state of Virginia, and I know that HR just has to work twice as hard to make sure that we find great teachers. And I'm very proud of Newport News for actually um, growing them up and teaching um, and being mentors to these new teachers. I attended the Virginia School Board Association regional meeting, and it was really nice to be with school board members from around the region. I especially enjoyed um, speaking with the mayor of Norfolk, Kenny Alexander. He was practically glowing about how successful their revenue sharing program had been between their school board, the Norfolk City School Board, and the city council. They are in the process of building four new schools in Norfolk. Uh, a lot of conflict is gone. And um, when the city, what he told me that really st stuck with me is he said, now when the city grows, the schools grow automatically. So um, I will be posting on my Facebook page some news articles um, and the agreement from Norfolk. I think it's a way forward for us um, to start talking about such an agreement with our city council. This has been the third year in a row that we've had trouble. First couple of years, we tried to keep it under wraps and, and didn't, didn't drag the public into it. But it's, and, and, and last year and this year, the volume is rising. And I, I think that um, we need to find another way. We need to make sure that everybody understands there are no salary increases built into our budget. We have to go to either the city or the state every year if we want to increase, even for inflation. There's no automatic increases even for inflation in our budget. That's why if we're going to give the state-funded raise, we have to get that portion, that local portion from the city. We can't keep taking those um, monies out of our operational funds or else we're going to get to the point where we don't have anything left to operate our schools with. A photocopy paper, fuel, paying utilities, that, that slice of the pie can't be used for um, salary increases every year. It's not sustainable. So um, I feel like I learned a lot having the meeting with the, the city today. Um, understanding their revenue structure is, is something that um, you know we we all need to to work on and, and communicate about. But um, I think it's it's great to have this communication, and and I know I have been just for the record, um, I have been having lunches with my city council um, cohorts uh, for the central district. And, and really, from what I'm hearing from the board, everybody's been um, meeting pretty consistently with their counterparts on city council. So we are, we are communicating. We know we have to do more of it. And, um, but we, we thank everyone for being with us and um, as we try to negotiate this budget. Uh, thank you, Ms. Simon. Uh, Mr. Ely. Thank you. I'd like to take the time to thank a couple of the schools that I had the opportunity to visit over the last couple of weeks. Um, Hines Middle School, Gildersleeve, Hilton, Deer Park, Sedgefield, and Carver. I told them I was going to do that online. A lot of the teachers and principals said, make sure you tell everybody on TV that we went to the school. <laughs> and can I, I would definitely say schools have definitely changed um, a lot. And the Chief of Dream. 
um, had a great um, visit with the Triple Dream as well. But just seeing how creative teachers are, each year I see classrooms evolve and evolve and evolve. And it's across the division with the different learning spaces. And it, and it, was, it blew my mind talking to a lot of the teachers. They said a lot of the furniture they purchased themselves. They purchased themselves. So when we in talks about giving raises to, to teachers, it's a no-brainer. A lot of those teachers do what they do because they love it. I had several conversations with teachers, janitors, bus drivers, everybody. And just the energy of the city council and the school board, they feel like they left out. They feel like they don't matter. So I, I told them we're definitely going to continue to fight for them. They, they, they will get their raise in the city council and the school board. We in, we're talking, we're, we're trying to make it right. And I want to give a big thank you to our superintendent, Dr. Parker, and the rest of the board. We have been going beyond the call, call of duty to do what we have to do, like Shelly said, to talk to our counterparts, to make sure that we give these races. Because what we have to realize is this is not about us. This is about the children. This is about the citizens of Newport News. And I feel like if we can, as a, both elected bodies, can take our personal feelings out of things and make this about the children, make this about the community, make this about teachers. Because I went to school, I am graduated New Palouse Public School, went to Mitchfield, it's not about me. It's about these kids that may be sitting in my seat within the next 15, 20 years. We have to make these give them the opportunities so they can live on. Mm -hmm. And we talking about this budget, now the capital budget. Visiting these, visiting these schools, I, like for instance, Hilton, they're over 100 years old. What we're going to do, are we going to have, the, are we going to have, a, I've foreseen visiting all the schools in the district, we may have to start doing like Norfolk doing, building five schools at a time. And if we don't address these issues now, I really don't know. Just looking at the, the Huntington alumni, they take time out of their day once a month, every event to advocate for the school. So what we're going to have to do, Huntington alumni are going to have to advocate, Carver alumni are going to have to advocate, Hilton alumni, like this has to stop. So we definitely have to come up with a better plan where the city know, okay, this year we're going to build three schools, we're going to build two schools, or we're going to come to a situation where we're building 30 schools at one time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Ely. Um, Soros Laws. Well, um, I'd like to um, congratulate Ms. Russo and her team. Um, I have felt the uh, fruits of your effort this year. Um, this being my first time on the board, first year on the board, and going through this budget season um, and being able to ask all the questions to understand what we're asking for, why we're asking for, and um, how it meets the needs of our students. So thank you very much for that uh, I got the chance to go to VSBA and for some reason I was drawn to all of the budget sessions <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, what I am really finding is um, you know across the nation budget issues are just that they're issues but there are many answers to how schools are are, are answering the mail on those challenges and I'm hopeful I've heard uh, things over the past few weeks that I heard um, at the conference and us exploring those, looking at implementation possibilities, what would fit, what does not fit. The main thing is, is that we have to stay the course. Uh, and as I'm just echoing uh, my members here, and that is we are building relationships with city council so that we better understand their plight but very importantly that they they really do understand ours uh, understanding that that investment in the city uh, begins with the investment in our children um, so i guess uh, my last comment would be the community has been vocal about what's important i i would imagine there that city council hasn't gotten many calls about not funding the schools. <laughs> so those of you who are contacting the council to say please do, please continue to do so. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Charles Laws. 
Uh, Vice Chair, uh, Mr. Brown. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, we're uh, entering the spring. The, the weather is getting much nicer. It's uh, been very, uh, very pleasant outside. And uh, like many of the board members, I had an opportunity to go to the National School Board Convention and, and as well uh, fulfill my, my duties as the regional vice chairman uh, by uh, putting on the uh, Virginia School Board Association Regional Tidewater uh, event with uh, Mr. Uh, chairman Cardell Patillo of the uh, Portsmouth uh, Public Schools. We had a really great and rich event. Um, uh, it was a lot of uh, good information that was that was had. Uh, me multiple members of the General Assembly were there for our, our uh, discussion session uh, and were there answering questions about, uh, in particular, school funding uh, and, and, in particular, school safety and, and other topics uh, of, of that nature. One of the things that they uh, mentioned that I've talked to uh, Chairman Patillo about that stood out to me was, uh, now is the time, so this time of the year is the time to talk to your, um, your delegate uh, or your senator and uh, put school funding into the front of their minds, answer their questions and, and educate them on what our issues are. Uh, they, they mentioned that, uh, you know, they mentioned that emphatically a couple of times, a couple of different uh, delegates mentioned, uh, mentioned that now is the time and these are folks who are on uh, budget committees. And they, they said that uh, once we get into the fall, it's actually really too late. And a lot of the times that uh, uh, in January when we have our, our annual legislative conference, it's already sort of, they're already in the midst of, of ha having a vote. So now is the time. Uh, and I mentioned that to the, the general public as well. Uh, for, um, you can do a lot for the entire state or the region if you contact your, your delegate at this time and put school funding on the front of their minds. Uh, and with that, it, we can walk into Cougum at the same time. It's time to put school funding on the front of your local elected officials' minds as well. Uh, so please continue to uh, contact uh, your, your elected representatives and let them know uh, how important school funding uh, really is. This would be, uh, this, this is a, um, you know, a, a, a difficult year in the sense of uh, level funding, uh, as was mentioned. There is no uh, inflation index to our budget. Uh, and, and level funding really is a cut because you think about the buying power of money uh, very simply you know inflation is three to five percent every year so getting level funding again uh, this year uh, locally it really constitutes a cut a reduction in our ability uh, in our buying power and in what we can do for our staff and the majority of the budget 87 percent of it is is staff and so every year that we're level funded is really a, another cut and you can see that very clearly that uh, what's what's striking is uh, while we're being level funded, uh, the budget is growing, the general fund is growing for the locality. So the city is getting more of the budget and providing less. This year will be the lowest that it's been in, I, I'm going to say, almost the, the history of the city going down to 24 percent, at least on all the graphs that we can see in the last 15 years. <coughs> in the last 15 years, this will be the lowest percentage of the general fund that we've ever received. We're down to 24 percent. During the recession, which was 2008, we were close to 30 percent. So we're we're down, no matter really no matter how you look at it, uh, we are we are down, and that has real uh, real impacts uh, to what we can do as a division. The kind of I talked about this earlier today, the kind of innovation that we want to pursue. Uh, we despite that, we we're um, we're going to be honored once again at the Virginia School Board Association. We're going to be presenting three. We got three presentations. I uh, want to congratulate the superintendent and his staff. We're going to be doing three great presentations. Uh, we've been uh, National School Board Award winners multiple years during this time when we've been getting cut. So we have done more with less. But it's time, it's time to now to do more with more. Uh, I, want to, I want to congratulate the Prevention Project. Uh, that is, I'm, I'm very proud of that. I believe that we are the only school division in Virginia to adopt a human trafficking, human trafficking curriculum to get on the front uh, side of that issue, to get ahead of it, and, uh, and to do it division-wide. Uh, we're uh, the f one of the first and the only. And I'd uh, love to see us continue to expand. We we've done middle school. I want to see us continue to expand to, to high school and, and elementary school as well in terms of our, our curriculum. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. At the National School Board Convention, got an opportunity to um, hear from the Society for Human Resource Management. They gave a, a presentation there. Uh, their lead attorney gave a presentation on what are the skill sets that are needed for the workforce of today, what are what are employers need the most. And the things that uh, he listed were writing, critical thinking, problem solving, public speaking, and technology. And then he talked about the work that our students are going to be doing in the workplace is cognitive uh, augmentation, uh, creativity, agility, and adaptability. 
And when you think about what those things entail and what those characteristics have in common, it's more about getting to the, the fundamentals of science uh, that are going to allow that type of adaptability. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm such an advocate for the art of problem solving. You hear me talk about that uh, so often. Uh, it, it is the curriculum that goes along with the American Mathematics Competition. So that's one of the most prestigious competitions in the world in terms of uh, offering students an opportunity to be worldwide recognized. Uh, the students who compete in the American Mathematics Competition have an opportunity to compete in the United States um, uh, 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 Olympiad and then go on to the World Olympiad. There's actually a World Olympiad and many of the uh, winners of that competition have gone on to win the highest honor in mathematics, which is the Fields Medal. Uh, uh, and so that's, and it's an opportunity that is affordable and available to all of us. Uh, we just have to adopt it as a, uh, as an initiative. And so when we think, talk about the works, uh, the skills of the 20, 21st century and what students are going to need, that critical thinking and problem solving is exactly what that, uh, what that type of, that, that work entails. It teaches the one thing that really holds students back when they go to college. So, so a kid, I can tell you this from experience and from having you know, studied mathematics myself, what holds a student back from being able to finish um, a bachelor's or a master's in, in, uh, or a PhD in the field of mathematics is that ability to do the problem solving of the proofs. And that's what it really teaches. Um, it, it, the art of problem solving uh, brings that uh, to life for, for a student and opens up a whole world of skills and jobs that would otherwise uh, not be available to them. So uh, that's why I continue to, to push on that and, and preach that. And uh, so finally, had a, had a great uh, you know, time at the National School Board Association. Uh, I got to sit next to, to John, uh, my colleague there, during uh, the uh, opening and, uh, and closing ceremonies. And he mentioned that he would like to see our students uh, up on stage doing the performances. We, we were uh, treated, uh, every year we get treated uh, to some just really outstanding student performances. Uh, this year, there was, uh, it was a group of kids from Georgia and another group of kids from Texas who uh, they did a, a fiddling uh, a type of mariachi uh, deal, and, and the kids from Georgia did a jazz, and it was a, a jazz performance. It was, it was phenomenal. It was really fantastic. And we said, hey, our kids are that good. We've seen our kids perform. They can do that. So I know that uh, John was nudging me saying, I, I, want, I want our kids to go up there. So I think that's a goal that we, should all, um, we can all strive to is, is let's see, let's see, you do see our kids uh, performing at the National School Board uh, Conference. Uh, that's that's a, an expense I'm, I'm very willing to uh, to vote for and, and have. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just with that, I'll, I'll just wrap up by by saying we are getting moving into the capital budget now. I appreciate Huntington alumni for you continuing to, to come out. Um, it's going to take continued um, public uh, pressure uh, in order to get a date certain. We still don't have a date certain as to when the school is going to be built. We have an understanding for agreement, but still not a date certain. And it's been a few months now. We still don't have a date certain. And so it's going to continue to take some public pressure to, to um, receive a date certain. I mentioned tonight that I would like us to adopt a timeline and a date so that we can start um, putting together what a budget and a plan would be uh, for getting that school built. Uh, but we do need an agreement on the other side to get a date certain. So the only, um, I think the only area where we're funded l even less uh, is in the capital area. And so we've seen that this year, that's what's playing out. The, the, the compromise that was presented was use some of the capital dollars that you didn't get um, and then we'll uh, let us let us hold it for you, and we'll give and we'll give the capital dollars that we didn't give to you. We'll give it back to you after you spend it. That's essentially what was presented to us as as our options. So um, you know, bottom line, uh, and I've seen this in uh, in in other divisions work very effectively in other um, localities. Uh, it's time to do a revenue sharing. Uh, it uh, as as Ms. Simons has already mentioned, fully support that Norfolk. Uh, they were, um, their mayor was out at Stanford University talking about how much of a success story it is that they built so many schools and how their division is on the rise and their whole city is on, is on the rise because of the revenue sharing model that they presented, uh, that they've done. They're, they're doing uh, a portion of their taxes are going to their schools directly and they've earmarked that for the schools and that's allowed them to uh, really grow the city. Virginia Beach, they do the same, uh, same type deal where they've got a revenue sharing uh, agreement. They get, they're taking their hospitality tax and it's going to the schools and they are almost never without a nice, shiny new school, you know. So uh, uh, I want to see us uh, get to that, that spot, and I think, we, I think we can. Had we been at 30 percent of, uh, of the operating budget during the last 15 years, imagine where we'd be given all that we've done. Had we been at 33 uh, percent of the capital budget, imagine where we'd be. Uh, when I first started on the board here, we were approaching schools that were 50 years old. It was the average age was 48 and inching up, and there was going to be a crisis. Well, we're already past 50 years now, so, so we're, we're in the crisis. 
this is crisis. It's crisis time. It is time for uh, those of you uh, Warwick and Huntington, and we talk about Sedgefield and a number of other schools that have been identified as three years ago. You were identified in the next five years. If we don't do something, then we may have to close the doors, like we did with Huntington. We're at that point now with multiple um, multiple school sites where we do need to start thinking about building ten schools at a time. Uh, and so with that, Mr. Chairman, I know I've gone on. I'll let that's my time to you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, there's not a whole lot much for me to say. <laughs> uh, I will say that there's great things happening in Newport News Public Schools. I will say that. And, and I will, um, I will, I do want to give a special thanks um, out for the Mayor Price and the City Manager and the Council members who did agreed to meet with us uh, earlier this afternoon. And uh, though we feel to be somewhat in the same position we were uh, this time last year, I, we may have taken a half a step forward. And uh, what we've done uh, through uh, Ms. Russo and her team and senior staff and uh, Dr. Parker, what we presented to them was three options on top of the options they gave us, but we gave them three options. So we were being, I consider, uh, proactive in that portion. Uh, we are going to take that proactive uh, action as well. Um, Dr. Bess and Mr. Harris, uh, I think we need to take that proactive when we try to move on Huntington. I think we need to just throw some dates out there and give a timeline and at least we have put it on the table because if we wait for them, it, it could be another two or three years down the road if we don't actually put something out in front of them. Um, and that way we can get some traction. I see that we have our public newspaper there and she would love to have a copy of that proposal that we put in front of them. Uh, to, at least she can post it in the paper. <laughs> well, we need all the help we can at this moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, the two uh, brothers back there, again, thank you for this staying for the long meeting. Uh, it's a pleasure having you here. If you need me to sign off on something to get your merits, I, I will do that as well. Uh, Again, we had the pleasure of attending the VSBA, no, NSBA in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, this board is phenomenal. Uh, when we walk around, um, uh, folks know Newport News. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've been on, we were on national stage last year, the year before that. I think, uh, Mr. Nichols, you presented last year, is that correct? You and your team presented the ES, uh, ESL the year before that. We won for our SPARK program. Uh, now, these are national awards, so when I do some time here when the council people tell us that, what are we doing with our money? Uh, we're, winning, <laughs> we're, we're winning awards. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're doing with the money that we give you. Uh, Ms. Russo again, won again with nine years in a row. We have Mr. Webb, he's the best in, <laughs> the best in maintaining our buildings. <laughs> we're, in, the whole, in the whole state. In the whole state. We had the gentleman who, we had, we had the gentleman who did the um, bus crossing, what's that? Was he state? recognized last month, mm -hmm. um, just out, we were just doing outstanding work. Uh, again, I want to thank the, those who gave reports this evening and those young men from um, the wrestling team. I want to thank them even though they're gone. Here, here's one thing that I'm going to thank Dr. Parker for saying. He said something very profound uh, last week when he gave the, the presentation. He said to the city council, I'm not going to talk numbers to you. He says, I'm not going to talk about, you know, supporting, you know, a budget. He says, I, I want you to support a vision for our students. Take the money out of it. He's supporting a vision. Supporting a vision. And so when I, so when I do look at the city center and I do see another building going up and there's a proposal for another garage uh, for $38 million, you know, the, and there's three garages over there that are not completely full, you know. And then when you go downtown Newport News, at the shipyard where everyone must pay, all our blue collar people with good jobs, most of them downtown, everyone has to pay and has to walk. So what's that telling us? And then I've got a white collar, and then now I wear a white collar. I get a garage for me for free. Th think about that. Think about that. And that's how we've treated it. This is a blue collar town. It's a blue collar town. 
blue collar town, blue collar students, blue collar parents, blue collar workers have built Newport News. We're still building Newport News. Those engineers and those plumbers you know, and those electricians, all in Newport News, not only do they go to work, they still help fund these monies we're talking about by parking in garages and walking to work. We have garages, and I am definitely for business development, but the development of this city is our students. Economic development, students. No need to stand before a paying teller when no deposits have been made. I say that every so often, and that investment is our students. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. And what we presented, and what Dr. Parker and his team has presented, I'm gonna tell you, this is my fifth year on the board. This has been the most detailed, comprehensive budget. I mean, I'm gonna tell you, I think I know where every, every dollar goes <laughs> now, you know? And, um, and we've, we've talked, we've been teaching our city council members exactly what is the budget, where it goes, that's what they asked of us, and that's what we did. That's what we did. And then um, we put it on the table for them, and I, I think, I believe that, you know, uh, that was the ninth inning for us. And so whatever comes out of that, uh, uh, we went to bat, we did our best job of doing it. And uh, again, the CIP is coming up. Um, we're learning. This is, this is a place of learning. So us board members, we're always learning what we need to do. So now we know, put the, pro put the proposals in front of them for Huntington. We need to do that. That really needs to happen because, uh, as we said again, most of our schools are 50 plus years old. Uh, 10 years from now, um, most of the schools gonna be over 60 years old. And while they're saying your population of students are going down, hell, we're still building room stores <laughs> and, and new buildings in city center. I mean, you look around, there's a lot of, so what are they saying? I, I, I'm kind of confused when they say that our population is going down, so you don't need the money, but we're always investing in economic development for buildings and what have you. So where are those people gonna live? They're, they're living here. I have yet to have someone walk up to me and tell me the reason why I didn't move to Newport News because y'all have got bad schools. I'm only about 11 boards and active on those boards. I have yet to hear one of those folks come up to me. Uh, most of the people that do the development, they live here. Mayor lives here. Some of the most wealthy folks live right here in Newport News. They haven't moved out. Go down the waterfront, they haven't moved out. Even if they're going to the private schools, the private schools still in Newport News. <laughs> so, so you can't say that because they send their kids to a Newport News school. So I've never heard that. Don't tell me. Then I hear realtors saying people don't want to move in Newport News. I say maybe because we've done an excellent job in an industrial, an industrial division and not did as a, a, not as good a job in economic development, which means housing and things that sort. We just don't have that many houses and new homes here. There's some being built now, but we just don't have it. But, but Newport News folks love Newport News schools. Last year, we, had, we were the only one that had two folks accepted to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Out of whole reason, even Virginia Beach, they got all their schools accredited, <laughs> MIT. So we just have to push. We, again, we just have to push. I do want to thank the city council, though, true heartily, that we are, and as they promised, I don't know how we got to the same place we were last year. We say we're going to meet. We did meet. But, you know, I think we were meeting just to meet. And we need to meet to move the agenda, hmm. right? It's the difference of having meetings to meet. And I, and I felt, besides today, we, we, we're, just, we, we're just meeting to meet. Oh, we met with him. We met with them, but are we really moving the agenda? And so now we have to have productive meetings so that we can move the agenda forward. There's no sense of us just getting together again and passing, you know, you know, throwing some numbers out and sitting there. So um, my meetings, or we're gonna meet now, our meetings is going to move the agenda. 
Okay. Our meetings is going to be in support of a vision, not a budget, but a vision. That comes from our <laughs> Dr. Parker, and, and I love that word. We should put that up. Newport News, great things are happening. Please support the vision of our students or of our economy or our economics. Now, that being said, I want to wish everyone a very happy and safe uh, Easter Sunday coming this weekend. And if there's no other comments or nothing else to come from our board members, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Just good Friday. Just good Friday.